when 9-11 happened, were you a brigadier general at that time? I was a brand new one, and uh, I was uh, just getting ready to assume command of the brigade that I ended up taking to Iraq. And I was in in a brigade that would, you know, 99.9% .9 have to go. So how was September 12, 2001, different for you from September 10? So obviously the 9-11 events happened the day before 9-11 happens. You know that the military is going to respond in some way. You're a brigadier general, so you're going to be making big decisions. So what, what begins to happen immediately in your role as a general in response to 9-11? And, well, I was rolling uh, before the second building fell, and I, yeah, you know, my my uh, during Vietnam I was active. In between Vietnam and Iraq, I was guard. I'm a citizen soldier by choice. I mean, I I go in when there's a war and you know do what's got to be done, and then I during between wars I try to be ready for the next one, or that's what I have done. So. On 9-11, um, I was rolling, I was in my car driving to uh, the state capitol uh, before the second building fall. I, I was listening to the radio, I heard the second building fall. And so I was on duty by, I guess by noon, I don't remember exactly the time. And, you know, it was a, it was a confusing time. So um, we were jousting at shadows, you know, people didn't know what to expect. Um, there was, um, you know, every, and then the other thing that was going on was that uh, within condos within the U.S., they were all of a sudden wanting to guard nuclear power plants, things like that. And uh, one of the sort of funny things that happened was, uh, you know, we were in the process of mobilizing um, reserve units and putting them out on the street. So... So, uh, and, you know, at that point, we didn't know what we were up against. So uh, I asked the operations officer, you know, give me an ammo status. You know, what what have we got? And the answer was nothing. Uh, we don't have any ammunition. So I said, call Fort Bragg and tell them we need to draw nine millimeter, 12 gauge uh, buckshot and uh, five, five, six. So uh, called and the answer we got was Fort Bragg didn't have any contingency stocks. All they had was uh, ammunition for the ready battalion and a backup for the ready brigade. There was no contingency stock period. So we put people around nuclear power plants on 9-11 uh, with ammunition that we bought in Walmarts. You know, I, I had uh, four soldiers and two trucks go around the state capitol and go Walmart to Walmart buying ammunition to guard nuclear power plants and air drones and you know stuff like that there is that sense of of um shock and and uh on 9 11 we don't know what's going on and now of course you know your junior officers your junior enlisted they're just waiting for orders you're the one who's yeah. getting these orders um in those first couple of days after 9 11 what possibilities do you have to i i'm guessing that you have to have to think out a few different possible scenarios and begin to plan for different scenarios. Is that right? Yeah, but uh, 9-11, we hadn't defined the enemy well. I mean, you know, we knew pretty soon that it was uh, a group of people that hijacked airplanes. They had a tie back to uh, Afghanistan and so forth. Uh, but my brigade was what they call a heavy brigade. A heavy reinforced brigade. I'm, you know, I was commanding a tank brigade at the time. Almost, it was, uh, it was almost five thousand soldiers, about uh, forty six seven hundred. Uh, and then you add on the stuff you get, and it jumps up to around five thousand. But we're a heavy brigade. I mean, it takes railroad trains to move us. You know, so uh, I was uh, in the queue to be the next brigade to go to the National Training Center which is a desert training out in the Mojave Desert to go through the, um, uh, the heavy uh, rotation out there. 
so anyways, a lot of fits and starts, you know, the, the, uh, uh, first army, uh, yeah, got these big four star headquarters and, and they're, they're trying to figure out what's going on. And frankly, if you do much research in it, you'll find out that the United Nations was doing stuff in, uh, <laughs> it's like, it's like there wasn't a central decider, uh, anywhere. So I was on alert, off alert, on alert, off alert. When does your brigade actually go to Iraq? We uh, were not, we were supposed to go in the original assault in March of 2003. Uh, we were cut from that and instead put back on the track to go through the uh, National Training Center. They were moving the dates up, back, you know, where it's just all sorts of confusion. But uh, we ended up going to the National Training Center in June, and we came out of that, and then we got taken back off uh, again. They're, they they hadn't decided what they were going to do there. They hadn't planned the phase two yet. So so phase two is OIF two, which is actually we had more casualties in phase two than we had in the initial invasion. Sure. Uh, you know, somebody said you know we won the war, and then the war started. So um, so we came back. Uh, I mean, I had to rail all my equipment out of California, railed it all back. What was the difference between the Gulf War and and the 2003 invasion into Iraq? And and the difference was in the Gulf War, we just went in there and gave them a good stomping, and then we left. In the 2003 war, we invaded, destroyed their military, and then we disbanded the military, and then... Uh, the ambassador did, and then disbanded the Ba'ath Party. That created a vacuum in the country because the military and the Ba'ath Party had run the country. It's similar to uh, the South after the Civil War when they disbanded all the all the governments and everything. So you had this vacuum, and and vacuums get filled by something. And so you got the belligerents, Iran, and these other countries around there that that immediately see an opportunity. So you've got to go back in and fill that vacuum. So that took away um, the ability for us to withdraw and let them put it back together themselves. We had to stay there in order to keep the vacuum from being filled by worse people than we, than we just defeated. So uh, I don't know if they figured that out to start with or what, but uh, but that's why you had to have the follow-on force. And then to compound that, it was an election year. So, which doesn't sound like much, but uh, I was in Vietnam during an election year and I was in Iraq during an election year. That's the worst time in the world to fight a war. The plan was to uh, essentially chase down the remnants of Saddam's army, which was where the initial resistance came from after the big thing, you know, uh, former Iraqi soldiers and things like that. So, uh, and then we were going to um, use contractors for uh, all our supplies, uh, food, food, water, spare parts, uh, latrines, all that stuff. So, because it was election year, and if the, I think it was the vice president who'd been involved with uh, Halliburton, they, uh, they started three investigations on uh for overcharging um uh soldiers i was in germany getting ready to go at the time and i told my sergeant major i said our soldiers will go hungry over this and and a lot of them did but uh but anyway they canceled every contract uh so uh when we went in my initial problems were spare parts and food and latrines and i, I mean i could sit here and talk for an hour about horror stories about about uh, what we went, but what it did, it caused the U.S. second wave to lose some of their momentum. I mean, you know, you probably have trouble getting a regular, a regular army officer, you know, at West Point or whatever, to agree with that. But that's what happened. We lost our momentum going in. I moved into torn up buildings and desert, you know. So, um, and to make it even more fun, I had about 300 women so you have to have the trains and stuff like that i mean you got you got to do something so anyway it was a, it was a mess and the u.s lost a lot of momentum 
because of canceling those contracts. Do you think that what sounds like a like a lack of planning, I don't know if, if that's correct, but do you think the assumption was that this is going to be another in and out Persian Gulf, it's going to be easy? And no, no, no real understanding that and that an insurgency might develop. Yeah. No, I I think had we been able to fill the vacuum, first of all, we shouldn't have made the vacuum. That was a horrible decision. Anyway, but but even if we did that and we came right back in there and started, uh, I, you know, which we did, but we lost about six months there. Uh, but if we could have filled that vacuum and started reconstruction in a visible way, the Iraqis were glad to see us. Most of them, you know, were glad to see us. But uh, but we had about a six month class. We could barely, you know, I mean, I have soldiers sitting in the dirt and eating sea rations for months, and I have two battalions that ate field rations. At, there's a one level above sea uh, for a year. I mean, they, they never got a mess hall. This vacuum is created because, as you say, the, the Ba'ath Party is disbanded. And yeah. we look back on that now and realize that a lot of people who are in the Ba'ath Party were just in it because that's what you needed to succeed yeah. in a career. They couldn't work if you weren't in the Ba'ath Party. School teachers right. were in the Ba'ath Party right. and they fired all the school teachers. <laughs> right. I mean, it was terrible. Right. And so you disband that and you've just created a lot of unemployed, angry people. Um, and we, I think certainly most people look back on that now and say that was a, that was a really bad mistake at the time. Were you paying attention to other things and not really focused on that or at the time, no, we, did you we think that was a mistake? No. Well, I did think it was a mistake and we were focused on it from the get go, but it's not an army decision. It was made at the ambassador level, uh, the CPA, Coalition Provisional Authority, who had uh, precedence over the military. But in in the military, we're out in the bush, so to speak. No bushes, really. But we're out there dealing directly with uh, the populace. And so we could, I mean, we needed some of those people come back we were trying to stand up city governments uh, um, uh, you know some sort of law and order and government uh, and we were prevented from hiring former math uh, folks I had the one good thing I had was I was overlapped into the Kurdish area and so I had a lot of Kurds who had not been in the bath party but they're very capable so I you know I use them as some but you know, when you when you start mixing Kurds and Arabs and uh, Sunnis and Shias, you know, you get into some complex, uh, uh, I guess, situations there. Um, not a lot of trust between any of those. So it's not hard, just given the basics of human psychology, to play this out. Let's say I'm I'm a teacher in Iraq. I don't really care about politics, but I'm a member of the Ba'ath Party because that's what I have to do to have this teaching job. These Americans come in. I'm glad to see Saddam Hussein go. I hope the best for my country. Next thing I know, I lose my job. I lose my capacity to support my family. And a few months later, someone comes along and says, hey, if you use your smarts to help the insurgency, we'll, we'll put you on the payroll. Yeah. It's, it's well, I... hard to see how that how that's going to happen. Yeah, well, that did happen uh, to, to varying degrees. It did happen. So you had, and, that, and, and you know, unfortunately, there was some of that. But I, I know within my unit and within our division, we were trying to get some moderation in that so we could hire back some of the bath, bathists. You know, they're not all bad. The high, the high ones were, but they're, they weren't all bad. And certainly not the school teachers, you know, the people, you know, at the lower levels. Uh, but initially they were, you know, we were forbidden from hiring them. And then, you know, so then we get rid of these folks who actually know how to do the jobs, the white collar folks, the professional folks, they've all been removed. So this vacuum is created. 
and then if I'm hearing you right, the U.S. has to respond to this vacuum that's created. And then sort of the cascading effect of that then is that there's less time and energy to make sure that the troops have good food. There's less time and energy to make sure that we've got enough latrines. Is, is that kind of what you're saying? That, you know, the vacuum uh, created by disbanding well, the Ba'ath Party leads to, well, it has this cascading well, effect. Yes. I mean, it. It uh, we had to divert more energy. I mean, I, I, I had the idea when I went there that I was going to get a brown root mess hall and I could put my cooks out on perimeter guard and then put my infantrymen out beating the bushes. And, uh, of course, not only did I not get that, but I had to bring infantrymen in to do KP. And, you know, if, uh, your, your life support uh, took up more time and energy than we had planned for, and that cut back on our mission. But we also had... Uh, I mean, we had supply problems, uh, you know, having trouble keeping our, our stuff running. Um, but I had a bunch of resourceful soldiers who were smart. And uh, I had one one battalion took uh, two or three five-ton trucks, went to a boneyard where they were, you know, uh, Humvees that were getting blown up. Mm-hmm. And they went to a boneyard where they were collecting all these, a collection point. And they come back with, um, I don't know, 10 or 12 blown up Humvees. And then they did a pick and pull, pulling parts off those vehicles, keeping their other vehicles running until we could get a supply system working. So it wasn't like we were just sitting on our hands waiting. I mean, people were pretty proactive um, in, in getting out and doing what we came to do. We were out in the population within 24 hours of hitting the ground. We were we were going out and meeting with mayors, meeting with police chiefs, you know, doing doing what we were supposed to do. But it was it was, you know, it, it could have been a lot easier had we not canceled those contracts. The contracts with the the civilian contractors who were going to right. build all these things. Yeah. They're not there, so now the army has to has to do all that work itself. Right. Well, that's what actually happened. Yeah, and, and we could do it, but it, you know, when you uh, like when in Vietnam you have the tooth to tail ratio, you know how many people you got out fighting versus how many supporting. Yeah, uh, it was close half the force in Vietnam or more who were supporting the other less than half who were out beating the bushes. So, uh, so in the, and, and soldiers are expensive. You know, the time you train a soldier, you got a lot of money and time in that soldier. So it's actually, you know, as pricey as it is, it's actually cheaper to contract support services if you can, you know, from a, from a taxpayer standpoint. The, you know, most of the Iraq uh, veterans I talked to course are junior enlisted guys um the war from their perspective is you know a tour on top of a humvee uh kicking in doors you know that's the perspective of the of the of the enlisted guy what did the war look like from where you were as a general what did the war look like from that perspective uh i had um Several thousand Americans, you know, uh, I moved a, uh, a battalion over to another brigade. So I was down to around maybe 4,000, 4,200, something like that, uh, U.S. But I immediately picked up, as soon as I got in there, I picked up um, about 2,000 border guards because I had about 200 miles uh, or 200 kilometers of Iranian border I had to secure. And I was, I was, um, gosh, I, I was in charge of an area about the size of uh, Connecticut or, you know, one of the New England states. So there's a lot of space. And within that space, I had a bunch of towns, you know, three of them were over 100,000. So I picked up all their police as well. They had, uh, they had hired some police. So I had another couple of thousand police. And then we, immediately uh, started trying to transition from, you know, initially it was like the Wild West. The uh, My soldiers were the rescue squad, the, the sheriff. I mean, we did everything. And we were dealing with some honest 
the gosh terrorists at the time too. Road bombs had an average of I was I don't know what the average was, but it seemed like I was getting two or three as many as five a day, you know, sometimes just once, once in a while, none, but we were getting them uh IEDs all the time and so uh and then I moved into an area that had loads of ammunition so I was finding tons and tons and tons of munitions so I was trying to dispose of that but when you find uh an old uh ammunition dump you have to uh, then guard it until you can get EOD in there to blow it up and uh so it's just manpower i mean everywhere everywhere i turn i was having to put more people out just to guard what i'd found that day so at, at different at times i had 15 20 ammo dumps that i was guarding until i could get around and blow them up so it was just a lot of a lot of different things and uh i was meeting with mayors uh governors uh the higher officials. I try not to, uh, small town mayors, I didn't, I let my battalion commanders handle them because, you know, once in, in the culture, they'll want to go as high as they can. So I would take away from my subordinate commanders if I stepped over them. So I, I tried to, you know, stay in my lane. That was one of my complaints about Vietnam was you had battalion commanders running platoons and and it just galled me to see, you know, you know, micromanaging platoon. So I, I went in saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay in my lane. So, um, it, I mean, I work, you know, 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, I mean, it was, I've been there three months before I took a half a day off, and I never took a whole day off. Uh, you know, it, it was tough duty. How long were you there? I went over in October of 2003 after the initial invasion, <clears throat> and then I came back, got my unit ready to go, and I went back in February 2004, and I stayed there all of 2004 and came out in January 2005. Were you um, involved at all in, you know, looking for the, the weapons of mass destruction? That's kind of a sore point, but there were plenty of weapons of mass destruction there. If you're, a, I don't know if you're in the service, but you ever, you've heard the term NBC, nuclear, um, nuclear biological chemical. Sure. The, the, those are the three, uh, that's the definition that I learned of weapons of mass destruction, nuclear biological chemical, NBC. So the big hoopla was over there was no nuclear program. You know, they had tried to start a nuclear program, and there were actually 500 tons of yellow cake still in the country from their original attempt. But then we were misled on the, the nuclear stuff currently, you know. But, uh, but there was a lot of uh, chemical munitions. They had moved most of them to Syria uh, right before the invasion. They moved a lot. But there was still, I never got out of reach of my gas mask. So... You know, I guarantee you, if you walked into uh, Times Square with a, a gas projectile, you you would be arrested for a weapon of mass destruction. Anyway, there's plenty of that stuff, and I never got out of reach of my stuff. And we actually, there were actually a few soldiers that were lightly affected by uh, nerve gas. Uh, but what they do is they try to take an old nerve gas or a white phosphorus or you know, some sort of uh, chemical munition and detonated in an IED. And almost all the time, you put a 100-pound charge with that, uh, it incinerates the gas. I mean, it, you know, it, it, just, it does away with the effect of, um, of the nerve gas. There were some rockets up in my area that I would have destroyed that had... Uh, I was told binary uh, nerve gas in them. They were the bigger, the, 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 they were on mounts that had been disabled. So they couldn't shoot the rocket, but the rocket was laying there with the stuff in it. And uh, frankly, I was afraid to try to destroy it, you know, because you're going to release, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I'm not an expert. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to undo that. So uh, somebody, that fell to somebody else, but there was, 
the the weapons of mass destruction there were uh there was no biological there had had a an aborted effort at nuclear but they didn't have a nuclear program they had like i say they had 500 tons of stuff to do it with and uh but there was plenty of of nerve gas so what I hear you saying is that kind of the popular idea that there were no weapons of mass destruction in in Iraq, that's just not true. Well, technically it's not. The definition of weapons of mass destruction became nuclear. You remember um, there was a guy, an ambassador or some in the State Department guy named Plain, who was flown to some African country to see if they had shipped yellow cake to Iraq. And, of course, they hadn't. Uh, or at least not recently, but but there was about 500 tons there. But there, um, somebody, I, you know, I've heard stories on it, but all I know is there was yellow cake there, but there was no active program. Yeah. But there were, there were, uh, I mean, there was, um, there were some storage facilities that we had to guard. I didn't, but in other brigades were guarding that had uh, chemical weapons in them. We link Saddam Hussein with um, terrorism generally, um, so we want to, uh, you know, hem in this problem of terrorism in the world. That's one objective. Another objective is to make Iraq, um, to help Iraq become something of a model democracy in the Middle East, a well-functioning country where people have a say in how their government runs in the Middle East. After your experience, or maybe a few months of experience in Iraq, um, what was your own sense of things in terms of how possible it was for Iraq to become a pretty well-functioning democracy? Um, well, let me make an editorial comment before. I think they chose the wrong message point for going into Iraq to start with. You know, I think the U.S. has a national interest in a stable Middle East. And if you're going to have a stable Middle East, you have to have some stability, if not control of the country of Iraq. Because if you look at how they're they're arrayed, you got your belligerents, Iran, Syria, uh, are counterpoised against Saudi Arabia, who is a friend, uh, but arch enemies with uh or Saudi Arabia, I mean, uh, Rand's arch enemies with them. Anyway, so Iraq separates all that. So if you can stabilize Iraq, you got a much better chance of having a stable Middle East. Not that we need oil, but if you're going to have a world economy, somebody needs it. So uh, the second part of your question, though, was uh, could they be a democracy? And I think the answer is, in my opinion, this, I'm not speaking for anybody else, but in my opinion, uh, Probably not, um, you know, for a couple of reasons. One, they have no, on average, the average Iraqi does not have a a good concept of what democracy is. And a good example is uh, we had an electric uh, power company uh, in my area, and the, uh, the employees in the power company uh, fired the power plant manager and came to us and wanted us to help us organize an election to elect a new power plant manager. <laughs> so, so we had to explain to them that you don't elect, you know, you elect your mayor, you elect your governor, but you don't elect people like that. So anyway, so there, there is not that. Uh, the um, T. E. Lawrence, I don't know if you've read his book, um, the, uh, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, anyway, great book. He made the comment in there somewhere that, uh, yeah, the highest form of uh, organization or government in the Arab world is the tribe. So I was there when we were trying to organize uh, elections and so forth. So, so, uh, so everybody in the country, they got to decide what political parties they were going to have. So the first cut on that was like 140 political parties. And we pared that down to about 40 some. But tribes typically do not trust other tribes. So you have, you know, or frequently don't, you know, so it's hard to get all these people to work together. And then on top of that, you had 
ethnically, you're split three different ways, Turkmen, uh, Arabs, and Kurd. So you, you've got the little friction points between each of those. And then within those, you've got Sh Shia and Sunni. And there's some other splinters, but mostly Shia and Sunni. So it's like a Rubik's Cube. And it's a Rubik's Cube that's, that Saddam twisted all up. And trying to put all that back together was graduate level work. Everybody you dealt with, you had to see what ethnicity, what tribe, what religion. You have to know all that when, when you're, especially when you have friction between two parties. You, you got to know the background on each one because a lot of time it's a friction point, not because of what they're telling you, but because uh, this tribe has bad blood with that. We had a town named, um, we call it Lasagna. I can't remember the. I can't remember the proper name. Uh, but anyway, we could never organize a uh, city government in that town. And we tried and tried and nobody could get along and so forth. And, and after I'd been there like five months or so, I discovered that the tribe, that the two tribes had a boundary in that town. So you had half town with one tribe and half town with another tribe. And you're never going to get them. Uh, well, I don't know, never, but... And it was hard to hard to get them to uh, come together on who's going to be the mayor. And on top of this, was corruption just kind of a, a fundamental problem that just got into everything? We initially thought so. But what an American would say is corruption is just a national order of doing business in that culture. You know, if I'm if I'm an Iraqi and you give me $10,000 to buy a generator to run the mayor's office, I'm going to take $2,000 off the top. That's the cost of doing business. Maybe I wouldn't, but that's the experience I had. And it's not considered, I mean, it, it is accepted that that's the way they do business. It's, you know, it, it's, it's cultural. You know, the, um, you know, air, as money goes down, they take their cuts, and we, and we really were upset about it. Uh, but I gradually figured out, and I, I'm not rationalizing here. It is part of the of doing business. You know, you, you, they, I don't, it's just in the culture. You, sure. you automatically, you, you should expect that, um, you know, money is going to be whatever the. Whatever, whatever the cost, I mean, two thousand out of ten may be high, but but there's there's a cost for processing things as it goes down, and so I think yeah, there's probably some real corruption. I mean, I had um, once we had had an initial uh, officials, they were trying to sell government buildings for maybe for personal gain, you know, stuff like that, and they were frankly they were desperate. I mean, they all the commerce had stopped. Uh, I mean, nothing was working when I got there. Wow. So, uh, so I, I'll, I'll give them a little bit of a break on on some of the corruption, not all of it. I mean, I mean, I, I had the, the governor trying, no, it was an assistant governor trying to sell government buildings to private individuals, you know, stuff like that. So that's just out and out corruption. Sure. But, uh, but. You know, reconstruction where you're hiring people, uh, there's going to be a little slippage in in between the boss and the workers, or in between the the purchaser and whatever piece of equipment you get. When you're working sixteen hour days for seven days a week, I imagine that in your memory, a lot of things just kind of melt together, um, and you know, a lot of things that in other circumstances, you you might have remembered clearly. They just kind of you know all melt together as these as one intense day follows another. But I wonder if there is maybe a a particular day that really stands out in your mind as just the hardest day that you had in Iraq. I had a town of about a hundred and a few a hundred little over a hundred thousand. And I had a supply, I didn't have it, a supply convoy that had come in from uh, Division of Sport Command to resupply me was going back through the town and there was a rock throwing incident where a little 
crowd of about 150 people were throwing rocks. And this private, who was not mine, somebody else's, but it's my town. So anyway, he ducks and puts his hands up like this, holding on to the machine gun, and accidentally fires around into the crowd, killed a uh, seven-year-old boy and wounded another boy. And, you know, of course, that undoes all the good I've tried to do in that town and all the trust we've tried to build. Here's a soldier dressed like me who just killed to killed it and wounded a children. So in that incident, they loaded up the dead boy, took him to a mosque, put the wounded one in a car, and that car started going down the main street. In the meantime, in just the time it took to do that, a young man walked out and dropped a, a drop and pop um, IED on the side of the road uh, near the market, turned around and started to walk back. The thing exploded, killed uh, two or three people in the market next to him. And uh, as a car with the injured boy came by, set it on fire. And uh, so now you got an injured boy trapped in a car. And uh, and then it wounded another man who was passing the other way in a in a some kind of truck. He got a piece of shrapnel in the neck, but it blew the power lines down and uh, went across the truck. And when the wounded guy in the truck stepped out, he was electrocuted. So he had dead people and pieces of people and parts and everything wound together. And uh, you know all this stuff. You know, an American soldier killed one killed one Iraqi accidentally. And we paid a salacious payment on that, you know, to get it okay with the family. And we paid a salacious payment to the boy that was wounded or to his family. Um, but stuff like that um, just tears you up because you work so hard to build trust and, and relationships. And then everything just goes to crap. And most of the people killed are killed by Iraqi. Most of the people killed are Iraqis and they're killed by other Iraqis. So that, that, that's kind of that's kind of day that uh, did really frustrating. Towards the end of the tour, the Hauser Cowie, you know, big time terrorist was in my area. We were training soldiers and every third week or fourth week they got paid and they went home. In this case, they were going to a town south of us and they were on buses. And these and are Iraqi his, soldiers. These are Iraqi yeah, soldiers you're paying? Yeah but, yeah, but they don't get to take their weapons with them. So they're unarmed soldiers in buses going to see their families and take money home. And uh, we think it was our Cowie and his crowd. Uh, what they do, they go over a hill and down a valley and over a hill. So they set up a uh, checkpoint and a bus comes over the hill. They stop the bus, kill everybody on it, except the driver. And uh, so then they moved over one hill and they stopped the next bus, kill everybody on that bus except the driver. And then they go over the hill and they, anyway, they killed 48 or 50 people uh, before we, you know, got it stopped. And so we moved and they're all shot in the head and we had to move all, all of them back. We, we moved them. We're, you know, we're trying to keep a lid on it, you know, because they, I mean, you know, it's just a massacre. And so we moved them to a small fob, and then we moved them again to uh, my big fob and iced them down like fish because, I mean, you know, we had no more situation to handle that kind of stuff. And uh, and then we finally got with them on us. But what that was, that was a bunch of um, Shia who had – who were all, I think all of them were Shia. They had volunteered to be in the army, and the Sunni, uh, Zarqawi Sunni, you know. So you had this inner uh, it's frictions, you know, and you'd have stuff like that. That's the, that was the worst one I think uh, that I had. But anyway, see, so you got a religious war, uh, ethnic war. You got all kinds of stuff going on. There's wars, it's like nested war, uh, battles within battles. You, you just um, referred to the kind of the complex situation, the ethnic, the ethnic uh, difficulties, the religious conflicts. And as I've talked to other Iraq vets, they say that um, the, the, ad, the, the adversaries 
kind of evolved and different adversaries kind of emerged over time. So you have former Iraq army, you have um, local insurgents, you have foreign insurgents, you have just criminals who become enemies. Uh, and and a lot of times it's not even clear who we're fighting. If, if an IED goes off, we're not even sure who set this off. Does that resonate with your experience? Yeah, it, it tracks very closely. You had uh, criminal gangs. You had former Baathists, they call them uh, former regime, uh, let's see, FREs, former regime elements or something. And then you had uh, out-and-out terrorists like Alzar Kawi, terrorists and Salafists who were coming in from other countries. Because the one thing that all the different factions have in common was they generally saw the Americans as an occupier because of our lag in getting reconstruction started. If we could have got reconstruction right in there, I think we'd have, we could have overcome that. But I met with all my constituencies uh, all across the area, and I don't know how many times I would tell them, you know, we're getting reconstruction money. We're going to rebuild this and do this and do that. And they would go, but when? You know, so in the meantime, uh, the the, the anti-coalition messaging is that we're an occupier. We're not going anywhere. And heck, no, we didn't want we wanted to go, but we had to get the place kind of stood up before we could. So, uh, yeah, that they're very much. I mean, it's it's like I said, it's uh, wars within wars. Um, you had, uh, I mean, it, 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 you know. This could be a book in itself, but, you know, Saddam had moved Kurds out off their ancestral lands uh, and moved Arabs in, threw Kurds out of their house for two hours notice and moved Arabs into those houses. 30 years pass. So you got a second generation adult men living in those houses and the Kurds come back after the war and say, get out of the house. It's my house. I tell you, the closest I ever got to where I thought I was actually going to shoot somebody was uh, in a meeting uh, where uh, it was, there were Kurds and Arabs in the same meeting, 110 degrees inside the building, and everybody in there had a gun. And people got so animated over this property, who owns what, uh, that they were, the spit was flying. And uh, I thought, this is going, in fact, I have a security team there i had a security team outside uh the security guy next to me said we've got to get you out of here i said i can't leave i'm in charge and so uh it got so bad that my outside security team came inside and started physically carrying people out of the meeting until we could get control of it again because i thought i thought honestly i thought we were going to go to shooting inside that meeting and this um oh this cur was shouting at, at an Arab, show me the graves of your grandparents. This is not your land. Show me the graves of your grandparents. And I, I can understand that. And then, oh, and Saddam burned the deeds or burned what documentation they had. So, so anyway, that was another one of the things that we were slow out of the gate. Let's say that you've been asked to, uh, and probably, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if this has already happened, but you, you're invited to give a 45-minute lecture on Iraq, and the theme is, you know, what, what should we have learned, you know, whether we actually have learned anything is the one question, but what should we have learned from that experience in Iraq? What, for you, are... The big takeaways if you're speaking to college students if you're speaking maybe more importantly if you're speaking to junior officers here's what i learned from my time in iraq what, what well, would you say yeah well it aren't it isn't the junior officers that are that get to make the decisions and it's not even the senior officers it's the Dern state department and the new and the united nations and you know, uh, people like that that decide uh, the things that that uh, 
made it difficult. But uh, A, do not create a vacuum that you can't feel, that you're not prepared to feel when you create the vacuum. Because when you create a vacuum, I mean, I mean, when I moved into the area, I was over toward uh, the Iranian side of you know, the Sunni Triangle. Uh, there were Iranian agents all over the place, and the place was awash in hundred-dollar counterfeit U.S. hundred-dollar bills that were coming out of Iran. I stopped. We stopped a car in a roadblock, and got nine million, eight or nine million dollars. You know, they're just flooding the countryside with um, counterfeit stuff. And anyway. So anyway, don't create a vacuum. Don't expect to make a democracy uh, where there's no concept of democracy. And, you know, have a plan when you when you go in on how you're going to get out. That was an old old adage that we used to use, but somehow, somehow we got into this one quicker. And, uh, and I think part of the friction was the, the loose motion between the uh united nations and and the coalition nations principally america and and it, it was an election year so everybody wasn't paying real close attention so so that that's what i would tell a group if you're a lieutenant you know uh, whatever try to try to keep your people alive and do the best you can 